the later half of the last century has seen enormous development in particle physics. Exactly at the time when uh, this institute was inaugurated, I had the privilege to be at uh, University of Chicago and as a graduate student and it seemed to me that the 450 MeV proton cyclotron was the frontier energy producing copious amounts of prions and muons, so copiously that we are all thrilled. By 70s, we were able to proceed and arrive at the beginnings of the standard model. <coughs> It looks four decades needed to complete the picture and on the eve of the Sydney International High Energy Physics Conference, we were treated by our colleagues at CERN that we are probably having a glimpse of the last remaining missing piece of that great model. Higgs boson, Higgs boson had arrived. We look forward to hearing from Professor Kimmel in the very first lecture, the Higgs mechanism and the what was to in fact follow. It will also be, there will also be a public talk later in the evening for the uh, general audience. First definite hint of experimental evidence beyond is matter of this symposium, the frontiers in high energy physics is obviously there in the Sanan model and beyond the standard model, hint that there is something in Newton of physics. The positive evidence that was a few years ago. One, that what we have been feeling is perfectly correct. Most do have mass. Then it is not a standard model particle, the standard model, and so we need to go beyond what has been published in the last 50 years and we have to in fact begin work. This institute has been instrumental in raising the hope that in here we will have a serious nuclear physics observations and efforts are on way to start ILO, India based nuclear observatory about which Noam Mandel will talk to you tomorrow. And they do hope that we will be in fact pushing the frontiers as much as possible whatever we have begun in this institute in the last few years. May I hope that I wish that instead of mathematical sciences we will have a glorious next 50 years in which further pushing the frontiers in all the areas under its study. With these few words I would like to begin today's session and call Professor Tom Kibble to give his talk on genesis of Higgs mechanism and electroweak symmetry transition breaking. Well, it, it uh, gives me great pleasure to be able to uh, participate in this uh, great event. And it is, is especially a pleasure to do so in the city of my birth, which I remember very well from a very long time ago. I will be giving a historical talk about um, the origins of the Higgs mechanism, and I will try to tell you something about what physics was like after the Second World War and how we developed the idea of gauge theories and uh, 
symmetry both in gauge theories and how that led on to the electroweak theory. Culminating, of course, with any discussion of the Higgs itself. Now, um, I began, I have always thought it was extreme good fortune that I was able to um, start my real career in, by joining the group at Imperial College that had been founded just three years earlier by Abdus Salam. Um, it was uh, uh, still a fairly small group, there were just three permanent faculty, but it was a very lively, very interesting place to be. We had lots of interesting visitors, Mary um, Ramad, Stephen Weinberg, many others. And a very, very lively place. So what sort of things were going on? Well, during the Second World War, of course, many physicists had been working on uh, military projects of one kind or another, the atomic weapons, radar, operation research, and so on. Then in 1945, they went back to their universities, and that led to a real flowering of fundamental physics. And the principal immediate uh, advance was uh, the normalization theory of quantum electromagnetics. As I'm sure you know, quantum electromagnetics always produced infinite answers. Um, and it was only after the Second World War that people discovered how to make these answers finite. That was done by um, Richard Feynman, Julian Schwinger, um, in 1947, and in fact earlier, in 1943, by Sinitiro Tom Tomonabe working all by himself in wartime Japan. Um, Prim Dyson showed that uh, although these three approaches looked very different, they were in fact um, uh, equivalent. And um, he also proved almost that um, the process work to all orders in perturbation theory. There was, however, a gap in this proof and didn't apply to overlapping divergences. And that gap was filled by Abdus Salam that really made his, his name as a, a physicist. Once we had a good theory of quantum electronics, of course, people started looking for theories of the strong interactions, the weak interactions, and, and uh, of course, gravity was a different matter, really. Initially, I suppose, most interest in, uh, attached to the strong interactions, naturally enough. But there's always a problem with um, strong interactions that um, it, it was difficult to calculate anything. Even if you had a field theory of strong interactions, it seemed to be impossible to calculate anything because there was no small parameter like the fine structure constant of quantum electrodynamics in terms of which you could expand. The corresponding parameter seemed to be of order one. Um, and for that reason, perhaps, um, uh, field theory fell out of fashion, and for a while, asymmetric theory was all the rage. Things like dispersion relations and regular poles and such like. Um, but there were a few places where the field theory was still being very actively pursued. One of them was Imperial College, another was Harvard. There were Others, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm going to talk about is more of gauge theory. So, what is a gauge theory? Um, quantum electronics, uh, of course, has this special feature of uh, gauge symmetry. And, um, as a Salam was always convinced as the number of other people, that a unified theory of all interactions should ultimately be a gauge theory. 
The first large daily ground QED was the one of uh, Young and Mills, proposed in 1954, um, which was a large theory of the SU2 other spin group. They were thinking of it as a theory of strong interactions. Um, the same theory was actually written down by a student of Salam's, Ronald Shaw, although he never published it except as a Cambridge University PhD thesis. <laughs> so at Imperial College, there was a great deal of interest in village theories from the beginning. Um, and uh, my first involvement was, uh, in fact, showing that uh, showing how gravity might be viewed as a bridge theory of the Poincaré group. Um, unfortunately, that's not a renormalizable theory, so it's not entirely satisfactory. Symmetry in general played a very big role in what we were doing at that time. Um, one of the problems we faced was that the experimenters had been finding dozens and dozens of new particles, all the, the new strange particles and so on, and uh, it became obvious they couldn't all be really regarded as independent uh, fundamental objects. And so to make, create some order, people grouped them into um, multiplets and found symmetries relating them. Things like uh, the eyes of spin SU2 symmetry and then SU3. And of course nowadays we realize that um, these are related to the, the quark content of the hadrons. The SU2 is really a symmetry of the up and down quarks and things made of them. The SU3 is a symmetry of the up down and strange quarks. These were approximate symmetries, so symmetry breaking um, became an important subject. <coughs> the idea that um, spontaneous breaking the edge theory might be relevant was actually first um, raised by uh, Nambu. Um, by analogy with uh, superconductivity, how the photon essentially acquires a mass in a um, superconductor. <coughs> That's the, the Meissner effect. Um, and he suggested that a similar process might operate for elementary particles. Another important development was um, Nandu and Renanusino suggested a specific model, not a gauge theory, but of a field theory which, um, in which there is a uh, symmetry breaking, a spontaneous symmetry breaking of um, a symmetry. This is a four fermion interaction um, where it has an exact symmetry and the ordinary phase transformations, but also a chiral symmetry. So I go through the alpha gamma five psi, and that symmetry is spontaneously broken <laughs> by the fact that psi bar psi equals a non-zero expectation value, and that in turn gives you a non-zero mass for the psi. So this illustrated that spontaneous symmetry breaking could give mass to uh, particles. Um, an interesting feature of that model was that it inevitably had a massless pseudo-scalar, for reasons we'll come back to, <coughs> which they identified with the pion. Um, they actually suggested that perhaps the chiral symmetry was not uh, completely exact even before the spontaneous symmetry breaking, and that's how the prion acquired a mass. Now, another important idea that was the idea of possible unification. 
Um, because of the difficulty that I've mentioned of calculating the strong interactions, a lot of interest starting to be focused on weak interactions. And um, a very important step here was the realization that the four Fermi interaction that was supposed to describe the weak interactions did not proceed through scalar tensor or pseudo-scalar um, currents interacting with each other, but vector and axial vector. And that led to the V minus A theory, which was proposed uh, by uh, Marshak and Sudarshan in 1957, <laughs> and also invented by Feynman and Gaman. That meant that the weak interactions could be seen as mediated by a spin one uh, vector boson, a spin one boson, W plus and minus, a pair with opposite charges, of course. And this made them seem very similar to the um, interactions of uh, photons in QED. And so people started to think about the idea of a unified theory of weak and electromagnetic interactions. There was a bit symmetry, where there was a similarity between the two. If you take a typical electromagnetic process, for example, the scattering of a muon by an electron due to the, the Coulomb interaction, this is due, we interpret it as due to the exchange of a photon. And similarly, if you take a typical weak process, the decay of a muon into an electron and a pair of neutrinos, that can be thought of as uh, proceeding through the exchange of the W minus. <coughs> and uh, that makes these two things look very similar. But, there are big differences. The most important, um, perhaps, is that the short range of the weak interactions means that the W particle must have a very large mass, whereas the photon, of course, because of the long range of the, um, the, the electromagnetic interactions, um, has to have more rest mass. So this is the big difference between the two. And the other big difference is that the electromagnetic interactions are powerfully conserving. They look the same if you look at the world through a mirror as directly, whereas the weak interactions are not. So that's another big difference. So obviously, if there is some sort of symmetry between the two, then um, it's uh, um, <coughs> inevitable that there's a broken symmetry. Now that's a bit of a problem. As we will see, there were a lot of people trying to make models of this sort. The first person, I think, to write down a, a bridge model of weak interactions was Julian Schwinger, um, who wrote down a theory involving the W plus and minus, and he suggested there might be some unification between those and the, the photon, but without really explaining how that could be done. A key development, a really major development, was 1961 by Sheldon Drachau, who proposed a model based on a larger symmetry group, not just SU2, but SU2 cross U1, which involved a fourth gauge boson, Z0, as well as the photon and the W plus and minus, and uh, an intriguing mechanism, a mixing between the two neutral gauge bosons. And he showed that by doing that, you could solve the parity problem in the sense that one of the four 
particles could have a parity conserving interaction while the others have a parity violating interactions. Salam and Ward um, wrote down a very similar model, also based on SU2 cross U1, um, apparently without uh, um, knowing about um, Glashow's work. <coughs> But the problem with these models is that the masses of the W and the Z had to be inserted by hand. And that, that um, unfortunately, has the effect of destroying the nice properties of gauge theories. It was very well known that a theory with spin one bosons with mass, with an explicit mass term, um, was necessarily a, um, um, a non-renormalizable theory. They were very divergent, so there was no way of making them finite. <coughs> so um, people started asking the question, could this be spontaneous symmetry breaking rather than explicit symmetry breaking? Now, spontaneous symmetry breaking is, is uh, a widespread phenomenon. Of course, particle physics has lots of approximate symmetries, and it might seem natural that some of them might be spontaneously broken symmetries. Spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, occurs very widely, particularly in condensed matter physics. Um, it very often occurs when you have a high temperature phase that is perfectly symmetric. And a uh, phase transition, when the temperature falls below that, the critical temperature, the symmetry is broken. The simplest example to think about is crystallization. If you have a round bowl of water and you put it on a table, uh, it looks exactly the same from all directions. The, the rotational symmetry is, is there. But it, when it freezes and ice forms, it will uh, break the symmetry because the ice crystals have specific directions in which they, they lie. You can't tell in advance which directions those will be. It's a spontaneous breaking of symmetry. Um, but that, um, as I say, a very widespread phenomenon it occurs also in uh, ferromagnetism. When it goes through a curry point, the ferromagnet can have magnetization in one direction or another. And it occurs in actually making a wedge symmetry in a superconductor. It also occurs in, in superfluids and such like. But there is a big problem with this idea that spontaneous symmetry breaking might give the masses to gauge bosons. And that problem was the Goldstone theorem. So let me tell you about the Goldstone theorem. The Goldstone theorem has to do with number Goldstone bosons. In many cases, the spontaneous breaking of a continuous symmetry leads to the appearance of spin zero bosons spin zero massless bosons, number goldstone bosons. The simplest example of this is the goldstone model, the one he wrote down to illustrate this, um, which is just a model of a complex scalar field with a somewhat unusual potential. Um, this is uh, some very shaped potential, which has a maximum at phi equals zero, and the minimum around a circle, which has a fixed magnitude of phi, um, but um, arbitrary phase. So the expectation value of phi may be, has a fixed magnitude, but you don't know the phase. This is spontaneous symmetry breaking. There is, in fact, a degenerate vacuum state. The vacuum can lie anywhere around this circle. And um, if you um, choose, for example, 
the vacuum to lie here, where phi is zero, then uh, if you make an expansion, you write phi in terms of its expectation value plus rho in the imaginary part, and you substitute that into V, you can easily see that there's a quadratic term in phi 1, but there's no quadratic term in phi 2. The reason is very obvious. Um, in the um, radial direction, oscillations in the magnitude of phi, V has a curvature, and that curvature gives you a mass for the phi 1. But in the transverse direction, where you go in the phase, um, V is, is flat, and that means that there's a less less scalar boson. Now, that's a problem. This was believed to be inevitable in a relativistic theory, for reasons I will explain in more detail. The problem is that nobody has ever seen a massless spin zero boson in, in particle physics. And yet, if they were around, they ought to be very easy to see. And so, if they are an inevitable consequence of symmetry breaking, <laughs> spontaneous symmetry breaking, that would seem to rule out that uh, theory. So, a lot of people who are trying to make theories of um, the strong and the weak interactions in terms of gauge theories, where you would need to get a mass from somewhere, there was a lot of interest in this idea and asking whether there was some way around the Goldstone theorem. And there were actually known counterexamples in condensed matter physics in particular in superconductivity, known but not terribly well understood at the time. Um, but it was generally believed that they were inevitable in a relativistic theory. And in fact, when Stephen Weinberg came to Imperial College um, for a sabbatical in 1962, he and Abdus Salam developed a proof of the Goldstone theorem for altruistic theories, um, which they published together with uh, Jeffrey Goldstone. And um, this is the Goldstone theorem. And the proof is uh, really very simple. <laughs> We assume, first of all, that there's a, um, a current that says that it is conserved. It says that there's a continuity equation, linear journey with zero. And that this generates the, the symmetry transformation in the sense that the variation of some field is given by, it's commutated with J0 um, integrated over space. And we assume that there is some field whose vacuum expectation value is not invariant. And thus the symmetry is broken. So those are the only assumptions you make. And then it would seem that linear gamma equals zero should imply that the existence of a conserved charge operator. It's not electric charge, of course. We're not talking about electric charge, but the charge corresponding to whatever symmetry we're talking about. So this is a um, the integral of J zero over all space should be time independent, and the broken symmetry condition is just the commutator of phi zero with phi zero with q. Um, has zero expectation, has non-zero expectation value. But if Q is time independent, that means that the only, if you insert intermediate states into this, here, in the middle of this um, commutator, the only states that can contribute are states with zero energy. 
And there are only low energy states available if there are massless particles around. Of course, you might think that the other vacuum states would also be a possible contributor, but that actually can be ruled out for reasons that will return to. So it's a bit of a problem. As I said before, there are counterexamples in Gnance Matter. And uh, Phil Anderson in 1963 um, pointed out that uh, you know, in a plasma, a photon acquires a mass and a superconductor. <coughs> but, um, and he suggested that a similar mechanism might operate for um, uh, elementary particles. But the general belief among field theorists at the time was that that couldn't happen in a relativistic theory because of the Goldstone theorem, which I just mentioned. So it was a, an impasse. As far as relativistic theories were concerned, it seemed as though spontaneous symmetry breaking of a gauge theory would lead to massless spin zero bosons. Nobody had ever seen such a thing, and therefore it seemed that uh, you could rule that idea out. On the other hand, if you put in the mass by hand, you get a very non renormalizable theory. Weinberg's comment was a quotation from King Lear nothing will come of nothing, thinking, speak again. Um, fortunately, uh, physicists did manage to speak again in time. Um, I was particularly interested, I became involved in this particular problem when a uh, young postdoc arrived at Imperial, Gerald Buralnik, <coughs> had been a student of Ron Gilbert in uh, Harvard, who in turn had been a student of Salam's. And um, I was very interested to find that um, Veronica had already been thinking about this problem and had actually published some ideas about it. Um, ideas which didn't turn out to be completely correct, but nevertheless put us on the right track. And we began collaborating, trying to work on this problem, together with another American visitor, Richard Hagen. And we and others eventually found a solution. And the solution was the Higgs mechanism. And this was uh, written down in, uh, by three different, in three different papers, all published in the summer and autumn of 1964, approaching the problem from very different directions, but coming to essentially the same conclusion. The first one by Francois Andler and Robert Wright from Brussels, the second by Peter Higgs from Edinburgh, and the third by Ronick Hagen and myself from Imperial College. And the simplest way of um, understanding this is in terms of the, the model, which we basically all wrote down in one form or another, <coughs> which is um, the abelian Higgs model. It was just the old Goldstone model with a gauge, the gauge field added. So in, instead of the ordinary derivatives, you have covariant derivatives in which there's a, a gauge field, A nu. We're still talking about a real one gauge theory, of course, at this point. And um, you have the electromagnetic field in terms of the potentials, the same um, potential as before for the scalar field. Now, if we again do the same decomposition, write phi in terms of an expectation value plus phi 
this role of imaginary parts. Then it also turns out to be useful to introduce this field B, MU plus um, this term. Now that is a sort of bridge transformation dependent on the phi field. And because that's of the form of a gauge transformation, the gauge fields F of mu and mu have the same form in terms of B uh, as they do in terms of A. And if you substitute these things into the Lagrangian and you pick out the quadratic terms, <coughs> um, you have a kinetic term for phi 1, you have a kinetic term for the electromagnetic field, or the, not the electromagnetic field, but the gauge field. Um, and you have a mass term for phi 1 as before, the same mass term. But you also have a mass term for B. And that arises from the B mu phi 2 squared part of the uh, kinetic terms. You can see that the derivative of phi 2 involves um, uh, involves essentially this combination in reading order. <coughs> so somewhat miraculously it appears you've got a mass term for the B field, then there are interaction terms, of course. So in, in some sense the massless gauge bosons and the massless would be Goldstone bosons have combined together to give you a massive gauge boson. <coughs> well, as I say, that seems slightly miraculous at first. We have to understand how it's happened. There is uh, a good deal more to this than I've said so far. First thing to say is that um, there are gauge modes. Um, if you look at the, the field equations, the Maxwell equations, d mu f mu nu equals j nu, in leading order j is just proportional to b. And these equations are also satisfied for any phi 2 at all, so long as b vanishes, or is some other solution of the Maxwell equations. That statement is just a statement of the gauge invariance of the original model. You can add any uh, term, any derivative term to the gauge field, it doesn't make any difference. So if you want to tie down not only B, but also the original fields that you started with, A mu and phi, you need to impose a gauge condition to fix, to get rid of this gauge uh, symmetry this gauge arbitrariness. If you choose the Coulomb gauge um, with B equals zero, the Coulomb gauge condition DK AK equals zero requires that phi should vanish or be a constant at worst. On the other hand, the Lorentz gauge condition, d mu n mu equals zero, only requires that phi satisfy the wave equation. There's a big difference between the wave equation and the um, Laplace equation. One is hyperbolic, the other is elliptic. Um, and so this uh, has non-trivial solutions, of course. In this manifestly covariant gauge, there are, the Goldstone theorem does apply, but the Goldstone um, boson is just a pure gauge mode. If I2 exists, it's a massless scalar field, but it, uh, it is not finite. It uh, has zero matrix elements between physical states. On the other hand, in the Coulomb gauge, um, which is not manifestly um, covariant, there are no Goldstone bosons 
And how did he manage to escape from the Goldstone theorem? Well, that's the question that was particularly asked by uh, my colleagues and myself. How did he manage to escape from the Goldstone theorem? <laughs> well, I cheated a little bit when I gave the proof of the Goldstone theorem. I, we assumed that Dini Dini equals zero implied the existence of a conserved charge operator. However, that is only true if you can drop a surface term at infinity. If you look at dq by dt, just take the time derivative of this, that's d0 j0 in the integral of that. That you can convert to dk jk because of the continuity equation. But that, of course, it can be written as a surface integral over some large volume. And that's, you can perfectly well drop such a term in a Lorentz invariant theory because the commutators, the commutators we're really talking about, the commutators of this object, the commutators all vanish outside the light cone. So um, you, you, can, you can certainly drop surface integrals in infinity. <laughs> But it's not permissible in Coulombage QED because in, in that gauge, the commutators do not vanish outside the light cone, they fall off rather slowly. And in fact, the surface integral doesn't vanish in that case. So, in, in fact, it's not just that Q is not conserved, it actually doesn't exist in the case of a spontaneously broken theory. The integral does not exist as a self-adjoint operator. You can see that that's true in the simple, in the simple X model which I mentioned. <laughs> the leading term in JMU, as I've already said, is proportional to B, B mu. And um, it's perfectly clear that the integral of B0 is not going to be a time independent quantity. And in fact, it doesn't be, the, this integral doesn't converge to a, um, uh, to a self joint operator at all. This is closely related to the phenomenon of unitary inequivalence. <laughs> we, uh, it's because there is a degenerate vacuum, we chose a state in which the expectation value of phi is zero. There's no phase factor. But we could equally well have chosen a state, say alpha, for which the expectation value of phi is something else. And if Q existed, um, then you would expect E to the I alpha Q to transform one vacuum state into the other. And in fact, in systems with finite numbers of degrees of freedom, exactly that does happen. But in this case, with a system with an infinite number of degrees of freedom, you find that the uh, zero and alpha, for however small alpha may be, are orthogonal. And in fact, all the matrix elements of any product of phi's between zero and alpha vanish for alpha non-zero. So what we have here are two different vacuum states which belong to completely different Hilbert spaces. On each of these vacuum states you can build a Fox space of particle states by applying the operators phi. 
but they carry unitary equivalent representations of the canonical commutation relations. And that is now recognized as the defining property of spontaneous image breaking. It's a very important feature. So that's how we managed to escape the, the Goldstone theorem. Now, how did this lead on to electronic unification? Um, the three papers I've mentioned received very little attention, essentially no citations at all for the first three years, um, ex except a degree of skepticism from a number of quarters. So by the end of 1964, we already knew the Higgs mechanism, and we already had the SU2 cross U1 model that Glashow wrote down, and also Slam Ward. But it still took three years more before anybody put the two things together, for reasons that are perhaps not, in retrospect, easy to understand. Part of the reason I believe is that um, the three, of, three groups who were looking at the, um, uh, the Higgs mechanism were still thinking primarily of strong interactions. At that time, people were hoping to find a gauge theory of strong interactions. And of course, strong interactions were also short range and so must have, one would think, a large mass for the gauge boson. So people were looking for, for that, and um, we weren't thinking quite so much about weak interactions. But it's still rather surprising in a way that these two things didn't get put together. I did some more work on the subject um, um, maybe three years later, um, looking in more detail at the application of the mechanism to um, non-abelian uh, symmetry groups. And that helped, I think, I had a lot of conversations with Swan uh, about that at the time. And I think that helped to uh, reinvigorate his interest in uh, the subject. Anyway, the unified model of weak and electromagnetic interactions um, was first written down by Stephen Weinberg. 1967, another Fitzroy letter. And essentially, these, the same model was presented by Salam in lectures he gave at Imperial in the autumn of 1967. Unfortunately, I wasn't there, I was in the States at the time, um, but I'd been told about them by Robert Alberto, who was there. Um, and um, uh, so I'm going to publish uh, until the following year in, in the Glass Symposium. He called it the electroweak theory. <coughs> so what happened after that? Well, uh, a, lot, a lot of things. Um, so Lang and Weinberg both speculated that their theory was renormalizable. But neither of them was able to come anywhere near to proving it. It's a very complicated problem. And the problem was actually solved by a young student, Harold Tohoft, in 1971, using methods that had been developed by his supervisor, uh, Tini Weltman, especially the computer algebra program Friendship without which it would have been almost impossible to keep track of the complexities of this. In 1973, uh, the key prediction of the theory, the existence of the neutral current interactions, those mediated by the Z0, this fourth gauge boson, were discovered at CERN. And that made people really take this theory very seriously. 
and in fact it led eventually to the award of the Nobel Prize to Erwin Glashow, Salam, and Weinberg in 1979. And Ward, John Ward was left out, even although he was a collaborator of Salam's in most of the papers Salam wrote on the subject, presumably because of the rule of three that the <coughs> The Nobel Science Prizes cannot be given to more than three people. Um, Taft and Beltman gained their Nobel Prizes much later in 1999. In 1983, um, the double and red bosons were discovered at CERN. And of course, during the 1970s and 80s, there was an, um, another process going on, which I haven't got time to go into in any detail, but the development of the gauge theory of strong interactions, quantum curve dynamics, um, in which, of course, the, um, uh, um, the Higgs mechanism does not apply, it's a completely different. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It works by a completely different mechanism, as I'm sure you know. So then we had the SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 standard model. Now, um, a few more words about the Higgs boson. In 1964, when we started this work, the Higgs boson, the, the, the scalar boson with mass, was really a very uninteresting and unimportant part of the mechanism. And the important thing was the mechanism that gave masses to the gauge bosons. The fact that there was also a scale left over um, was uh, mentioned, especially by Peter Higgs, but um, it didn't attract any particular interest. It wasn't a very exciting fact. But after 1983, when um, all the other features of the standard model had been found, it started to assume um, a, a great significance as the last piece of the jigsaw. And of course, um, people began to find motivations for the development of the um, um, Hadron Collider at CERN. <coughs> Finding the Higgs was one of the principal objectives, not the only one by any means, but one. This is a, a, an astonishing piece of engineering and, and physics altogether. Um, I remind you where the LHC is. It uh, occupies this 27 kilometer long tunnel in, um, in Geneva spanning the border between Switzerland here and France over there. And you can see the size of it if you compare it to Geneva Airport. <laughs> um, and associated with the LHC, there were these, there, there were of course, four experiments around it, but two in particular, um, which uh, were um, Atlas and CMS, which uh, were dedicated, um, at least to a large extent, to finding the Higgs particle. These are really astonishing pieces of engineering and physics. And over a huge 20-year period, these big teams of people have been designing, uh, building, and finally operating these uh, Things. This is a um, picture, not a very clear picture, unfortunately, of um, the CMS under construction, but it gives you an idea of the, the scale of the thing. Um, 
um, because you can see the people standing in, uh, around here. <laughs> and the uh, scale of the um, operation is also illustrated by the sort of event they were looking for. They, um, this is a possible Higgs event. Um, the protons come in and collide along this line and um, they, they produce um, hundreds of particles in many cases. And uh, it's these two tracks that are relevant in this particular case. But the amount of data, of course, is, is uh, enormous. And the result is the almost certain discovery of the Higgs, of, of some kind of Higgs, I believe. Um, Higgs is um, supposed to give mass to particles. There's a little bit of confusion sometimes about what's said about that. Its primary purpose was to give mass to the W and the Z. <coughs> or of the original particles, of course, it was to give mass to whatever gauge bosons were around, but eventually in the electroweak theory to the W and Z. But then, of course, it became clear that it would also be masses to everything else that it interacted with. Including electrons, for example. Um, it, it's often said that the Higgs gives mass to everything else, but that isn't really true. It does give mass to almost all the elementary particles, um, except the neutrinos, and we now know that the neutrinos do have masses, but they don't come from interaction with the Higgs. But protons and neutrons, for example, acquire uh, most of their mass from the, the gluons by a completely different mechanism, has nothing to do with the Higgs, and we have really no idea at all where the tiny neutrino masses come from. The Higgs doesn't actually explain the masses. Um, it just uh, tells you that the mass is proportional to the coupling strength to the Higgs, but that could be anything. So, it, was it really the Higgs that we found? Um, I, I mean, the evidence for a particle uh, very similar to the Higgs with a mass of 125 GeV is now extremely strong. But is it clearly the standard model Higgs? Well, there's certainly a lot of work to still to be done. We don't yet know, I believe, that it is spin zero and not spin two. We know the spin is even, but it could conceivably be two. We know it decays into more or less the expected channels, but it's not entirely clear that all the branching ratios are exactly what you would expect. Um, I think personally that it is almost certainly some sort of Higgs. There are, of course, other possibilities beyond the standard model. Um, people have speculated that it might be a, a, a supersymmetric. In, there might be a sort of an every extension of the standard model. And um, um, that would be a very exciting possibility because it would explain various other things, including dark matter perhaps. There were hints of possible discrepancies in the branching ratios, but I believe um, those have rather um, been weakening recently, and that's the recent reports. So uh, it's perhaps not very encouraging for supersymmetry, although it certainly hasn't been ruled out. It was actually the end of particle physics. Uh, absolutely not. Um, the standard model is a, a beautiful model. It, its predictions are verified to 
enormous accuracy over a huge range of different phenomena. It's, it's one of the most successful models we ever had, but it's a, it is a bit of a mess. It involves something like 20 arbitrary parameters, things like mass ratios that we can't predict. It's not really a unified model because you've got three symmetry groups with independent coupling strengths, so there's three independent coupling strengths. Um, of course, there are suggestions that uh, they might all become unified at a much, much higher energy scale, not 10 to the 100 GV, but 10 to the 15. And one of the reasons for favoring supersymmetry is that this behind unification idea works much better in a supersymmetric extension of the standard model. And of course, the standard model doesn't include gravity. For that, we need perhaps string theory or rem theory or loop quantum gravity or something else. So that brings me more or less to the end. Um, I want to finish by acknowledging my gratitude to my uh, mentor and inspiration and friend, Abdus Salam. Um, he was really a, uh, a brilliant physicist and an inspiring leader, a skilled diplomat, as he had to be, of course, to get support for the International Center in Trieste, um, and a known and generous man, and it was a very sad loss when he died prematurely in 1996. Thank you. Einstein and Mach uh, proposed that the inertia of all things comes from the distant bodies in the universe. And there is some support in general relativity for this idea. But uh, Higgs mechanism seems to at least explain the masses of the bosons, as you said, and the leptons uh, as coming from this field, which is a non-trivial expectation value in the vacuum. Could you comment on what possible uh, philosophical or real connections between these two completely different uh, things, one in the very elementary particles and the other in the large-scale structure? Yes. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that there is any particular connection there. I, um, I, I don't think that uh, Marx principle has ever really been prominent in the world that, um, uh, that, uh, mm -hmm. a very much result. Uh, I, I, I don't know of a way of um, uh, sort of being in reality. So, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> This is not a question, it is a comment. Just adds a little piece of uh, thing to what he said. Mm. Uh, after the gas theory uh, <coughs> of Engels, yeah. uh, one of the very early applications really went to strong interactions. You mentioned, you hinted at it. I just wanted to add the name of J.J. Uh, Sakurai. He wrote a beautiful paper in 1960, I think, in Annals of Physics, mm. playing uh, Engels theory to strong interactions, where of course you had to put the masses of the gauge bosons by hand. But yeah. it was a very, very influential paper. At least it yeah. influenced me to believe that the animals solves the problems of particle yeah. masses, even at that time. No, you're perfectly correct. Uh, Sakurai's contribution was very important. Um, I, I should perhaps have mentioned it. You didn't mention the role of local gauge invariance. How fundamental is that to creating these theories uh, in addition to the fact that you have to create a gauge covariant derivative? But beside that triviality, is there any, 
I'm sort of interested in you expanding on how fundamental that concept is. How fundamental the concept of local building managers. <laughs> but that's hard, hard to say. Um, it appears that the gauge principle has proved to be very fruitful. It's not obvious why it should, should be fruitful, um, but it has led us to uh, a very successful collection of theories. And uh, it does seem that local gauge invariance is a, is a very fundamental part of our uh, understanding of physics. But I don't think we really understand why that should be true. Um, so I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but... Uh, well, you did. <laughs> Thank uh, Tom people for a wonderful evening. <laughs> <laughs>